Hello there, Dota 2 fans, and welcome back to Sad PP, the South American Dota Pro Podcast. Today, we've got another good one and an exciting guest, the South American who has defected a little bit playing in North America. We've got Leeless Dota. You might know him as Les Lau. Um, very excited to dig deeper into uh, what he's up to and some major talk as he's going to be heading that way before too long. Bowie, welcome back to the show, buddy. Hello. Always glad to have you here as well. All right, let's go. Uh, I want to I wanna hit you with a question here. So you won that Mercedes uh, as the MVP prize winner. I saw some stories. I think you got delivered to Brazil. Are you going to keep it? Is it expensive to keep it? What, what's going to happen with it? Uh, so I got the car and it didn't really get delivered. So how they did it was oh. they just gave me uh, like a check that I could use at a, at like a, a store. And then oh. I got whichever car I wanted, and then they would pay like a fixed amount, right? And then they pay that part. I got the car, and I just sold it because <laughs> tax is just way too high, and I don't yeah. really need a car, right? I don't really leave my house that much, so I have a driver's license, but wow, it's not very useful to have a car, honestly. Like today, I can just go anywhere with an Uber or something. I don't really need a car, so then I just sold it, and. Yeah. Was it easy to sell? Like, where, could you uh, yeah, get an extra? Like, a week. like did, did you mark up the price because it was like the car? You know, it's like the less loud Mercedes. That, were you able to market it at all? Nah. <laughs> I, what, so, like, the, usually you sell it for less, right? Because just because you're not, the, you're the first owner. So, if right. the car already has an owner, it usually sells for less. But since there was a pandemic going on, they're not producing any cars. It was the oh. like the best car in the market, right? Because it hadn't really. I didn't even get get it out of the store. So then I sold it for the same amount I bought it. So that was pretty good. Okay. Well, that's that's pretty cool, but uh god damn. Yeah. That's such a cool prize, but the 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 reality is so much shittier than being able to have a cool car, I guess. Yeah. It's just way <laughs> too expensive. Taxes are just too high. It's like uh what is 4% like 4% a year oh, on the car just to have it. That's like the per year property. That's a property tax, yeah. Damn. Wow. And then like there's all the costs, right? There's like gas, there's maintenance, there's Insurance, all, that all that shit. Yeah, yeah I was checking. Yeah. The, I actually want to ask you. Really really. I was looking at the insurance price and I don't think I actually got the right model, but like even similar models. Do you have any idea how the insurance for a car like that would cost? Because here it's like um, 2K USD, I think a month. That's a no, that's a fuckload. Like I have a, a lower end Mercedes that's used and I have to pay uh, more in insurance because it's a quote luxury vehicle. But I think my insurance is like a thousand a year or something like that. Oh, so yeah, maybe it depends it was... on like how old you are, right? That you have the yeah, car. I'm probably like 24. So uh, then uh... it's gonna be more expensive for me than it would be for someone that's 30, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, you're probably right about it. That. It depends a lot. Yeah. Okay. Damn. All right. Wow. All right. My second question anime do you care at all about it <laughs> do you think the anime will have a positive impact in dota 2 what are your thoughts do you watch the, the trailers new blood uh i don't really watch anime the only anime i've watched i've watched a little bit of naruto when i was younger but that was a long time ago and like cartoons so i don't really watch mm -hmm. anime i don't have anything against anybody who watches it it's probably fun but yeah. i'll probably watch the dota anime i think it's good it's a good step it's something valve should have done right already i think like something like this but they're doing it now so were you mm -hmm. surprised like when you saw the announcement what was your first reaction because i was just shocked i i actually i i wasn't even like this is cool this is stupid i was just like is this real like is it april fools that was that was my first reaction <laughs> yeah it's probably my reaction too i was thinking there's no way they're gonna do this it's just so random right like, why are they yeah. doing this anime thing now it doesn't make any sense they don't really do anything to market it now you're just doing it and that thing on Netflix. I thought it was yeah. kind of a joke, but then I looked at it. Oh, it's actually serious. Look here. <laughs> Apparently, it's like super old, right? I guess maybe they were just super like they didn't want to release it too fast, but it's been going on for at least two years. So maybe like Valve saw it coming that, you know, they were losing players, but they didn't want to rush the anime or something. I don't even know how involved they are. Well, honestly. so here. Yeah, th this is my fundamental question with this. 
who's paying who or is nobody yeah. paying anybody? Did Netflix come to Valve and say, hey, we want to pay to make this show? I mean, it's it's got to be expensive to do an animated series, right? It takes a shitload of time to do that much animation. It's it's probably like millions of dollars budget, I would guess, to produce a, a tier one show mm-hmm. like this, right? Really good voice actors are expensive, all this kind of stuff. Is Netflix footing the bill for that and then paying Valve like some sort of flat fee for the licensing rights to use the Dota IP? Or did Valve go to Netflix and say, hey, we've got this really cool existing IP. Um, we'd love to, to pay to be able to get this on Netflix because we want to leverage the free marketing. Like, which way did it go? Because if Netflix came to Valve, that's fucking genius, dude. You're getting the free marketing, plus you're getting paid for supplying the rights, and you don't have to produce the show. You just get to sit back, collect your check, and go, ah, I hope this show turns out to be pretty cool. Look at all these new players we got. I mean... I guess, but like, wouldn't Netflix go to League of Legends first, though? Like, would Le- League of Legends actually reject Netflix? Well, maybe the the price differential was really high. Maybe it was five million mm. to to get the League of Legends rights, and it was only five hundred k for the Dota rights. I don't know. Who knows? True, true. I mean, Lee has their own thing, right? They already did some. Was it a movie? Do? I don't know what it was. I they, 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 they announced thing. a movie or something. Oh, or maybe it's yeah. not out yet. I think. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so maybe that's why. Maybe you're know. right. Like Riot's like, hey, why would we hand this to Netflix? We're just gonna. That is the kind of their business model. We're gonna own everything. So, you yeah. know, why give <laughs> yeah, it to true. them when we could just use our animators to make our own thing? So, um, mm-hmm. and that's very like Dota, right? Like I could see Valve being like, oh, you want to pay us and then do all the work? No, oh, all right, yeah, we we might be into that. That's that's very Valve, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I, mean, I think that's was probably what happened. <laughs> I feel like. Uh, so I I also want to talk about something else. I think for like foreign viewers that are watching, maybe they don't really know about this, but like Lele is used to stream in Portuguese, and you switch to English, and right. I, I saw like you got a lot of backlash. I think a lot of uh, Brazilians kind of misunderstood that you're only allowed to speak Portuguese in your stream, and like. Uh, like it's forbidden to do that, but I've seen like people just doing it fine. Do you think people misunderstood what you were doing? Like, why do you think you got so many so much backlash for that? Uh, I mean, I think it's just something that it will happen anyway or the other because I've always streamed in Portuguese, right? And then it got to a point where I thought I was at a plateau, so I wanted it, I wanted more, so mm-hmm. I just have to take this step. And a lot of people don't really speak English, so then they're like, oh, uh, we gave you the car, right?" you should stream in Portuguese uh. for us when it's like, it's not really true. I, I had a, a bunch of people voting for me and that, that thing, I had like a bunch of people from Peru vote for me too. Like if, if you look at the statistics, probably like more people from Peru voted for me than people from oh, actually really? Brazil. Cause there's okay. more players, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. like a lot of people say that it's not, it doesn't really get to me. It's not really true. Right. And mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people, they think they, there's like this thing where you, you watch a streamer, you feel like, they owe you something, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it doesn't really work like that exactly. It's it's hard to compli- It's com- kind of complicated to talk about it, but I, I think mean, a lot of people see it like that, right? Like they kind of they kind of own you, right? You have to do what they want, and yeah. it's not mm-hmm. really how it works. I kind of do what I want to do, and it's pretty much it. As a as a foreigner, I can't help but think maybe a little bit, bit of that is intertwined with the Brazilian audience that tends to be very prideful, kind of in all things, right? Not just related to esports, but Dota included in that and doing that hard switch away from Portuguese into English. I I, I can't help but feel like that could be some of the reaction is just this inflated sense of betrayal perhaps where obviously from your pr- perspective it's nothing personal it's just it's really a, a matter of business right you're trying to reach the global audience not just the brazilian audience um mm-hmm. but the fans might see it slightly differently yeah that's like exactly what you said it's like uh, <laughs> it's exactly yeah, it's just what you said so the brazilian audience they're very emotional so they right. either they love you a lot or like they despise you very much so it's just how it is. It's not good or bad. It's just the way it is. And a lot of people didn't take it very nicely. Like, uh, but it doesn't really bother me. Like, I have to do it. And it's what I want, right? 
So yeah. Um, speaking mm -hmm. of of uh, fellow Brazilians in the Dota space, by the way, I hope you don't mind me interjecting here, but I was just <laughs> talking about this on uh, the Trenton Zayori podcast with Dakota because uh, they had missed this whole uh, drama, let's call it, with Bait and the Brazilian players over there oh. and Astini and Duster and Astini's mm -hmm. sudden departure and the the oh, yeah. strange circumstances around it where he writes this blog basically saying Duster sucks and he's the reason that the team sucks while he's complimenting the other four players. Um, and one of the things that we mentioned in that podcast was this dynamic of the English-speaking Dota audience really doesn't know who his Astini is because most oh, yeah. of his stuff has never really been translated to English. Nobody's really given a shit enough to like translate it and put it on Reddit. But um, to the Portuguese audience, I guess he has quite the reputation. And I noticed since he's back home, he's been streaming and racking up the subs. And uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious what your take on that whole thing with, with Bait and the Brazilians going over there and... I don't know. Any experience with Duster? Uh, should I feel bad for him, or was Astini completely right? I still don't know what to think. Uh, to be honest, I don't know exactly what happened. I only read the post, and I don't really talk to them that much. So, mm. Astini, I think he was a big part of the team. He actually, like, he has a, lot, a bunch of contacts. He can get, he got, like, some orgs for them here, and he mm. really helped them a lot. Like, the players with being able to have an org, being able to play and all that stuff. And he also does like coaching. Like he's kind of their coach. He watches a lot of replays, he analysis the last of the team and stuff. I think he was a really big part of the team and him leaving is it's pretty big, right? It's like especially almost, halfway it, it feels, through the it feels season. Like, like that's huge. Yeah, if it, it feels like the team is just kind of dead now that he left, honestly. That's mm. what I feel. But maybe I'm just wrong. I don't know how the dynamic is, but that's how I felt. I felt like he was, yeah. he kind of carried the team a little bit in that sense. Maybe I'm, I'm completely wrong. I don't want to say that I know what's happening, but uh -huh. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what ha what's happening in that team. I was, I was pretty happy for them from going to CIS. I think it's pretty good. It's good that Brazilians be able to play out of SA because yep. on, in SA, you have to play on ping and then that, that's just trash and you don't get to play with Europeans. You don't get to play with people from other regions like NA. It's like these two reasons are not that great, right? And then you're just playing with people that aren't that good, so you're not going to get that that much better, right? If you play with people that are better than you, you're going to get better. So it's good. I think it's good for Brazilians to play out of Brazil. So I was pretty happy for them when they got that. But yeah, from what happened now, I'm not really sure what, what the drama was exactly. Yeah, no yeah, it's really weird because I... Um, so SG changed coaches, and I was the one that actually referred to them, a friend of mine that's from Romania, and before I did that, I actually tried to pitch Dandy, this friend of mine. And he was like, no, but Astini is still with us. So, like, we don't need a coach. But he was, like, streaming, talking shit about bait <laughs> at the same time. So I'm not sure if Dandy just, like, didn't know whether Astini was out or, or something. But I, I, I still don't really understand what happened to It, it feels yeah. really blurry to me. Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know exactly either. It's just... Uh, I. As again, as an outsider, I was just very much taken aback by a coach leaving mid-season instead of waiting till the end of the season, just because that is such a shock to lose that resource partway through. Um, and then also just the nature of the post, like singling out one player. I guess I maybe it's happened before, but I don't know of too many examples where a coach has like hung out the <laughs> dirty laundry, so to speak. Like that's a bombshell to drop. I mean, I guess I'm not. I I guess the... I'm not one to talk. I did that. I left BTS, then wrote a book about it, and hung all our dirty laundry out. So I, I kind of get it. But <laughs> fuck, man, I'm not a coach. Well, you know. <laughs> what was that NIP coach? I think that, that was probably the the closest thing that happened, right? Uh, was it? What's his uh, name again? Yes, clairvoyance and PPD. Oh I guess yeah, that was okay. maybe similar to that. Yeah, that's. But a, there was that's... like money involved too. It's an okay example. I'm sure there are some examples, but um, not a lot, right? Especially not super recent either. So mm -hmm. just a wild situation. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I guess my uh, the last question that I had prepared here was uh, about the time with Flying Penguins. I heard you stayed in Eternal Envy's house for a bit. I uh, oh, wanted shit. to know if you <laughs> if you have any any takes. What was he like? uh what was you know playing with him stuff like that 
Okay, so with Flying Penguins, what happened was we were there was a test one two three three, and then that got DQ'd right from that yep. major. And then mm -hmm. we we played an NA as well. I think we went and we played as Flying Penguins. I'm not sure exactly. I know that I we ended so. up with that team, and then we we were playing for the NA quals. And then, I mean, I wanted to come to NA to play on low paying right for the qualifier. So I was like, I mean, I'll come over. But I don't have a place to stay, right? And I don't really want to rent someplace. It's gonna to be too expensive. I don't. I don't. I, at that time, I didn't really have any income. I was kind of broke. Mm -hmm. So then, and he said, "You mean you can stay at my house?" And then I said, "You have a computer and shit." Yeah, I have a computer, a chair, everything. I'm sure I'll All come. Right. And then I went over. I stayed for twenty days, and it was pretty good. He treated me really well. Uh, I don't. I don't think I can complain about anything. This he was, was really 2019, nice right? Like uh, early 2019. Yeah, yeah I, I think yeah, so. Yeah, it was in 2019. Okay. And it, he was pretty nice to me. And I, I don't think I would do that again now because now I, I will probably just maybe just rent a place. But mm -hmm. like I had to do it then because I, nobody really knew who I am and I really wanted to win. And I had just had to make like, you can call it a sacrifice, right? It's not really the end of the world. But <laughs> uh -huh. it was pretty good. Like uh, pretty grateful that he let me come over. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, Envy is definitely one of those guys. If he believes in you, he'll he'll go the extra mile, right? Like he's he's a a weird guy and an introverted guy, but not a bad guy. And I, I could totally see him being a, a fun host in that regard, especially if you're there for a purpose, right? Yeah, yeah. Power up. Yeah. It's, it's like an anime storyline there. You know, I can I can <laughs> see it. Yeah. I mean, so and we won the qualifier, right? We w went to the minor. Yeah. There yeah. You. So that was that go. was pretty fun. Was the I actually forgot which minor. Was it in... Uh, the Starlighter minor? No, it was a Starlighter minor. And it was in Ukraine. And we got fourth, I think. It was oh. pretty good. Yeah, we yeah, did yeah. pretty well. And uh, why did that team broke up at the end? Uh, I left the team. I didn't really want to do this thing where I was going to travel for every qualifier and then I was going to travel for the tournament. Right? Oh. I didn't really want to do it because it was way too much travel. And at the time, I got a really good offer from Payne. Mm -hmm. to like make a team and build a team and i thought it w i would it would be better to just take the offer mm. i see um yeah so you've played though in like a lot of different orgs like you've played in the key orgs in south america like sg pain and now you've been playing in north america for a while with quincy quincy crew and you guys are obviously looking really good you bdg you're going to the major super exciting um congrats on all that how does it compare i, I mean quincy crew is sort of unique because you guys are contenders for best in region and you're a, a player run org right you're not like an eg or an sg where you've got this org who's paying you salaries and all that stuff so i that's like a a, a unique position to be in but how do you feel about the conditions in NA? Does it feel palpably different than South America? Uh, and you've been playing from Brazil this whole time, right? You're you're just playing through ping. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the conditions are. I mean, when you don't have an org, you just you don't get a salary, right? You don't get boot camp. That's that's the big differences. You don't get a salary, and you don't get boot camps, and that's pretty much it, right? Besides that, there's not that much value an org can add. Maybe they can hmm. make your travels a little bit better. They can it makes like some small things better. But usually that those are the big two things. And not having that doesn't hurt that much since we're in a pandemic, right? We probably wouldn't be able to do that anyways. Hmm. True. But maybe if we had an org, I could come to NA, right? It would be easier for me. I mean, what about but, hardware, though? I mean, in South America, it sounds like a lot of players don't even have, like, stable connection or, or PCs to, to play from on a professional level. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it really depends where you live. If you live in, a, like, a suburb city or something, it might be really bad. But I live in, in the capital of my state, so it's pretty chill. I, I have, like, a lot of options. It's not that bad. Like, my... I have two ISPs, so if one goes down, I'll just go to the other one. Oh, right? shit. Nice. This guy's a real professional, folks. That's dedication <laughs> I mean, yeah. right there. You just have to be professional. Like You can't be <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. joking around with these things, right? You get, you go to the qualifier, and then your internet goes out, and you're like, oh, I can't play, guys. Like, What a joke, right? Yeah. Dude, I, I had the same setup, but then my power would come out sometimes. So that was, that was yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, you can't do, do you anything have about that. you have an O-break? 
<laughs> I mean, I have a no break button, not like a generator. So oh, maybe yeah. it, it won't survive enough. But mm -hmm. the conditions are pretty much like playing without an org is those are the only things that make a difference. And it's not that bad. It's, it's okay. So it's like only like you're not getting a salary. Mm -hmm. And I played on orgs and SA. So the SA orgs really don't play that much of a salary, right? Because they're yeah. already from SA. If you compare the pay from NA to SA, it's a lot higher for NA because the cost of living is also very high, right? Right. So SA orgs can pay less, right? I mean, if, you're in if a. You just compare the exact amount. Yeah. You're in a cool position to potentially be living the dream. Like, if you're a part of an NA team, you get an NA salary that's comparable with your NA teammates, but you're living in South America and that USD goes real yeah. far. That's, yeah, dude, that's your <laughs> yeah. sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really nice. Yeah, the conversion rate is like really super high. So I get to live a really good life where it's cheaper. Yeah. You mm. can advocate that it's a third world country and stuff, but. It's not that bad. I've lived in NA too. It's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, and NA's got its pretty rough spots also. I, I guess if you want to get vaccinated, maybe Brazil is not the best spot to be. That's that's the big drawback right now, as far as I know. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's not great. I mean, maybe maybe if you had that doctor license, maybe you could have uh, got an earlier one, but uh, not the case. But all right, jokes aside, I, I wanna I wanna pick your brain a little bit. So you, you play in a pubs, which means you probably play with a lot of SA players. Is there an SA org or a player that you think is underrated and you think he might, you know, uh, in, the, in the upcoming years become, you know, popular, more known? You think there's like someone that you see grinding those pubs and uh, you don't think people like give him a lot of credit? Grinding pubs. Wait, let me yeah. check the leaderboard. Because <laughs> <laughs> could be from anyone. The top of my head, not really, but let me see. Because usually I, Cause, I know all these players, right? They're, they don't yeah. show out of nowhere. True. It's just that, like, I feel like NA, like, a worldwide people might not know players that, you know, for you are kind of known, but they're, they actually aren't, you know? Like, outside of the... The sleepers, the pub stars main, that are just waiting yeah. to get picked up right now. Yeah. Outside of the Pains SGs from Brazil and Beast Coast, I guess. Uh, Someone that's, like, super... That's super... Not really... Honestly, like most most players already have teams, right? They're already playing the DPC. True. I think no, I I can't really think of someone right now. Mm. All right. Okay. Honestly, there's not there's not much like lot new players in Dota, right? Mm -hmm. the game's kind of stale in that regard. So. Yeah, maybe the anime. It's gonna help, especially in North America. <laughs> that's a that's a big issue. Um. I this is a weird question, but I guess like what what do you feel like is missing? from orgs in South America? Like maybe as sort of a side question, where's pain? Why are they not part of this DPC season? Um, and how come all these lower division teams that we polled and said, what would you do with the prize money if you won a major said, buy a computer and create an org to help the players? Like my takeaway from that is, huh, are the orgs that exist right now not helping the players enough? Uh, it seems like there's... There's still something missing in South America in terms of team org infrastructure, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts as to what that is. Uh, so first, I think South America is pretty divided in Dota. I think uh, it's mostly Brazil and Peru, right? Mm -hmm, and yeah. Brazil is not as big as Peru. In Brazil, the dominant game is League. So there's not as many players playing Dota. And the Dota, people don't get that much viewership in Brazil from Dota. So it's not that attractive for sponsors. So mm -hmm. Payne has been in Dota for a long time because the owner of Payne, that is Pata, he plays Dota and he's mm -hmm. a huge fan of the game. So he's always had this connection with the game. And that's one of the reasons, right, that they've been. Of course, they have other reasons. But Dota's not really a profitable game, right, to sponsor. You don't really, the sponsors don't really get anything from the game. So, like, why even bother? Why, they can just sponsor a Free Fire team. That's like the mobile game, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a PUBG. Yeah. It's a battle royale phones. game that's super popular. I've heard and of it. I know these, it's like these people crazy get millions and yeah, it's crazy. Like people get millions, millions of followers. It's crazy. Why would you sponsor a team that has this guy that has a hundred followers on Instagram? It, it makes no sense, right? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. like why yeah. give him a computer when you can give this guy a phone and he's gonna get a million followers. It doesn't make no. any sense, especially in Brazil. But in Peru, there are a bunch of orgs. 
Mm -hmm. but people don't have that much money right it's just uh uh, the infrastructure is not there so i think in peru there's a lot more sponsors and like thunder predator they're beast coast na right but they pay any salary for sa players so then they got that one but they were infamous before so there's there's a lot of peru orgs that give good conditions it's just in brazil it's not worth it it's not worth it for an org to sponsor a team like sg is doing it because those guys they really like the game. They play the game. Like, the owners, they play it, and they believe in the game. They really want to invest in the game. Yeah. So it's more like of a passion thing. More than if you look at it from a business standpoint, it doesn't make any sense. Because Dota doesn't make any sense for a team to actually sponsor it, right? You're not really getting yeah. anything from that sponsor. I think Unless your team goes to PI and they make it really big, right? Yeah. So it's mean... like this one tournament or year-centric thing that you can just not go to TI. Your investment it just is trash. So... Being number Mm. one in any region is always going to be disproportionately like number one is number one, you know, going right into the playoffs of a major is a a big deal from like a sponsor perspective. So I, I kind of get that. Um, But yeah, I, I I think everything you said is, is, is totally accurate. Um, God, it sucks. The region's so divided though, I guess is kind of my, (laughs) my big takeaway. Like you guys, South America is almost two regions within it, you know, Portuguese and Spanish. Yeah. yeah, but like in the same vein, I guess. Do do you think the the DPC format is a step in into a better direction? Because you get like these two teams from SA that go to the major might not be TI money, but it's uh, it's a little bit more. Do you think like I, I guess it's better, but do you think it's good enough? I think it's a step in the right direction. I think what they're doing is what they're trying to do is good. I think it has a lot of flaws, right? I think. Only playing each team once is just bad. It's just straight up bad. And I think mm. what happened in this qualifier that it, almost every region has a tiebreaker just shows that the system is just bad, right? Why <laughs> yeah, would the, I, I don't think you I should agree. be having tiebreakers. This is like an exception. Yeah. But every region has a tiebreaker. And then we play this best of one against Undyne. And everything is up to this best of one if we're going to the major or not. It does, it's kind of silly, right? So I think yeah, I agree. the format can have some changes. But I think the prize money going to... Other teams, not only top heavy teams, I think mm-hmm. that's really important. It helps a lot, especially in these other countries that are not like NA, right? That the money means a lot. In NA, what can you do with five thousand dollars three every three months, right? It's not that much money. But yeah. in SA, that's mm-hmm. a that's a fuckload of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So uh in that regard, I think it's pretty good. I think the format needs to be changed a little bit, need to be tweaked. I also think that the price will for majors is way too low. I think what they did for that was just bad. Like, why would they decrease the the major price pool? It doesn't make any sense. You can tr- you can travel. Let's say us, Quincy Crew. We, we're, I'm going to travel for a whole day. I'm going to get two 12 hour flights to go to Singapore, and then we might just get knocked out on the on the second day. And then I come back. I spend like three days there, and I don't get paid for it. Right. Right. True. It's like only top eight gets paid for the major. And it's just that's just pathetic. I think that's just it's straight up oh, wrong. Actually, they should change that. That doesn't make any that. sense. Yeah, you're right. I knew it was a smaller price pool, but I didn't know you didn't get paid. Uh, I mean, before. they they're gonna say that we they paid you for the DPC season, right? But that's not really they paid you for the season. They didn't pay you to go to the major, right? Yeah, it's kind of different. Well, so sure, and, we, yeah, go ahead. Well, do you feel similar about the wild card? It's a little different because NA and SA were not included in the wild card, but four teams eliminated out of the six that come. It's like you fly there to get eliminated immediately. It's it's a do, do you like that format or is is that too brutal? I think it's super brutal. I think sure you can say that they're giving them a chance, right, to play against the better teams, but I think Valve isn't broke, right? They could pay these teams. <laughs> it doesn't it wouldn't make that much of a difference they pay these teams 10k, right? Just pay them 10k. What would happen? Yeah, um, they make millions and millions off TI, and then they're just paying first place at the major 250k. It's been lowered, right? Yeah. It was a million, and yeah. now it's half a million. You have 18 and, teams at the major, and only the top eight take away any money. And like, obviously, those eight teams also get DPC points. So it's like, you, even if you just get prize money for the bottom half and no DPC points, that's still a punishment. Like, that's not a handout. You know, everybody really wants the DPC points. It's just getting yeah. zero in both columns is. It reminds me of the lower division now, where you get relegated and you get zero prize dollars. Oh it's yeah, like, getting relegated that's... is already an insane punishment. Like it. Do- 
<laughs> Nobody wants to be relegated. Just add prize money to it. That's not a fucking handout. It's still super hyper competitive and cutthroat, even with the prize money, you know? Yeah. Yeah, just I agree. Everything is just super accumulated in TI again, right? Mm -hmm. TI just means everything. These majors, they mean nothing to the big teams. Like, they don't give a shit. 250K? They don't really care. You win TI, you get, I don't know, 10 million? It doesn't mm -hmm. really make a difference for the teams, so... That 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 I think is just bad. They're just concentrating everything around TI, and that's not very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good for yeah. the teams that win, right? It's good for OG. They won twice. They're just fucking rich. But the for system the rest, is it's not still. Very good. It, it's just too top heavy. It's like if you're winning, you already get rewarded by winning, and then the rewards attached to it are so disproportionately high. Like winning this first major puts you in such a crazy good position. I guess really it's placing like top three or top four that really sets you up because the DPC points don't scale that much. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I think you're totally right. Spread the love, man. <laughs> Um. Uh, all right. I I actually have a, another question. So I know that you dabbled in engineering for like two years, and then you tried to become a doctor, and that didn't work out. Uh, like what was the fact that you didn't get approved the reason you get back to Dota full time? And regardless of that question, do you have any tips from people facing a similar struggle? You know, deciding if they wanna. Uh, dedicate their time to a game uh, versus, you know, uh, university. Right. So I think uh, what, what I dropped out of university because I wasn't really liking it. I was doing mechanical engineering and mm -hmm. it wasn't really working out. I did two years. So then I just dropped out. I didn't like it. And then after that, I tried to go to med school. That didn't really work out. I didn't get uh, enough points on the exam. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then I was in a spot where I could study another year and try to do the test again. Or I could just do something else. And honestly, I didn't really want to study for another year. And I just told my dad, let me do this for a little bit, please. I just want to do it for a little bit and see what happens. But at that point, I already had played for several orgs, right? I already been playing competitive for a long time. And I was doing True. it at the same time I was studying. It wasn't like so I'm 3K. Let me just do this, <laughs> right? I was already playing with big players. like Not big players, but I was already playing with... Uh, I was playing the SA Quals. I was like one series away from going to TI a bunch of years, right, in the SA mm -hmm. Quals while I was studying. So I already was like a pro, but I wasn't full-time pro. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that makes a difference if, you're, if you want to quit or not. I don't think you just, you're 3K and you're just going to say, I'm going to quit and I'm going to go full pro. I feel like that's just, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Maybe you can do something that's your hobby if you're already really good at it and you're doing something else that can maintain your your life, right? Because I was young and I live with my parents. So I, mm -hmm. I could do it. Mm -hmm. I could afford it, right? Because my parents were just they were there for me. But I think if you want to throw your studies away, I think it's really, really dangerous. And I wouldn't recommend people to do that. I did it because I already was in a spot where I wasn't really losing anything. It was just going to be a year or two. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not studying. And if it didn't work out, maybe I would go back to something else. So I didn't really go. I mean, I kind of went YOLO, but I didn't really. It wasn't. It's like a middle ground. It's... Yeah, it was like it's like a middle ground. And yeah. I, I was already, I was almost there, right? I was almost there already. It wasn't something from zero. So I think that's a big difference. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I always think of Zai as a good example of that, where he was playing pro, very young, and then took time off, finished the degree, and oh, then came true. back to pro. And he was almost better, um, like, after he came back. It's like that time off, like, improved his game in some way. And obviously, he still played for fun when he was studying. It was just not playing at a pro level and making that your full-time priority. Uh, but I, that, those are wise words, man. I, uh, I, I felt like I was lucky where I discovered esports when I was halfway done university already. So I was just getting into it as a hobby and thinking about it full-time as I was finishing my degree. So it was like a, an easy decision, but I think backup plans are generally a good thing. You know, <laughs> that's going yeah. all in is fucking scary, dude. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that wraps up most of the, the stuff we had to talk about today. Uh, oh, one, one last thing. Um, any thoughts around uh, the, the match fixing scandals that have been coming to light, I guess, specific context on zero 900. Ooh. Um, 
I guess when you saw that announcement, were were you surprised? I, I saw some people talk about that uh, Jericho had maybe a little bit of a reputation for doing some stuff like this and exchanging insider information in the past, and had you know maybe been warm, warned by a team captain or two in the past, and still was repeating old behavior. A any credence to that? Any any firsthand experience as a player in the space? Uh, I've never actually had any experience with people that actually max fix that actually know that it happened. Yeah. But I know it happens. Like it happens because it happens mm -hmm. in almost every region, right? In tier two Dota, it just happens because people just don't get paid, mm -hmm. so they have to do the shit. So I think it's a these people aren't bad people. They they just do it because they need the money, right? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't see them as uh being monsters or anything. It's mm -hmm. just uh the situation they're in. There maybe they just have to do it. And I mean, everybody knows it happens, right? I don't know. In China, it happens all the time, right? We just don't know that it happens. It doesn't get that much coverage because mm -hmm. it's another region. Mm -hmm. And not really. I wasn't really surprised because it happens. It's just a matter of time when people figure it out. I was kind of surprised that 0900 did it in the DPC, right? Because usually people do it in these third party tournaments. Mm -hmm. They're just full yeah. of 322s. And if people just actually investigate, they maybe they'll find something. Yeah. But. That's pretty much it. I don't really have like a hot take on it. Honestly. That's that's cool. I, I guess uh, no pressure there. I was just curious if you had anything to add because all this stuff. I mean, I'm sort of observing as an outsider, and I always feel like there's potential for things to be missed in context, or you know, things that you might be privy to as someone that's in the space. But uh, um, yeah, it, it's just shitty. It, it's like kind of news that I wake up to. It's like, oh man, this is the last thing wanted to hear today especially a team that was gonna be going up to upper division it's like god damn it guys you were you were on the path why but i do think it led to a, a broader discussion that was helpful about this idea of insider information and how that's in this sphere of unethical behavior not exactly like match fixing but in that realm and uh, I, hopefully there were at least some people that learned that that's a potential recipe for disaster you don't want to be leaking secrets no 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 that's uh, that's bad mm -hmm. news, especially when we're talking about like DPC league format stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, just throwing that PSA out there again in case anybody <laughs> missed it. Uh, Leelis, man, appreciate you coming on and being so candid with us. Good luck in the major, man. I hope you guys slay it. Congratulations on doing so well in North America. Uh, we'll be watching and cheering for you, man. Make sure you give this guy a follow at Leelis Dota on Twitter. L E L I S Dota. And uh, he's streaming on Twitch as well. I appreciate you, man. I hope you guys keep slaying it. Vamos. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty fun. Fucking vamos, man. You when you guys win the vamos. major, we want to have you back, though. All right? Sure. Oh. sure. All right. Deal. Good deal. <laughs> Bowie, always a pleasure as well. Folks, we're going to have a few more episodes before the major in the next season of DPC, talking to some more folks from the region. So stay tuned. Per usual, find us on iTunes, Spotify, subscribe to the YouTube, and uh, we'll see you on the next episode of Sad PP. All right.